Um, as, as Peter mentioned, really what I'm trying to do in a nutshell here is to examine uh, the difficulty that whereby we have a very desultory uh, and deliberately so approach to the past, um, uh, embedded very much from the Good Friday Agreement and, and the political settlement that that um, prompted here. Uh, and given the vacuum that we have in terms of how we deal with the past, I think the arts have played a crucial perforce role in conflict transformation and have very much been centre stage literally and figuratively in that area uh, and I think conducting some extraordinary work. So just with that preamble I'll just, I'll just start and try and keep this to 40 minutes. Whilst we have no formal mechanism or central commission to investigate the past or to undertake any form of truth recovery, a rich commemorative culture of memorials has flourished in the North. It's one of the most prominent features of our post-conflict society. The Norse landscape has been increasingly colonised by an efflorescence of statues and shrines, plaques, crosses, cenotaphs, obelisks, boulders, benches, murals, monuments, memorial stones, sculptures, windows, walks, fountains, gardens and trees. As these memorials, sacred and secular, personal and political, embellish and encode city streets and rural roads, gable walls and urban estates, pavements, hilltops, and public squares, private clubs, community centres, churches, crossroads. Their plenitude... Sorry, I should have been in sync. It's some of the, some, it's just some of those. Um, their plenitude, a perverse reflection of how we have signally failed to deal with the past. The fact that so many of these memorials are frequently attacked and desecrated symbolises itself enduring disagreements and divisions as to how the past is remembered and memorialised. It's hard not to feel some sympathy for critic Edna Longley, who I'm not always sympathetic with, but her laconic suggestion that we should collectively erect a statue to amnesia in the north and then forget where we placed it. However, physical, the physically solid memorials are actually never stable signifiers of memory, in spite of their obdurate and unyielding materiality. For instance, on the hillside above the village of Green Island looms the largest war memorial in the north, the Naka Monument, its stern basaltic presence staring over panoramic city views of Belfast. The, the foundation for the stone was laid a month before partition midwife the state of Northern Ireland and inscribed in the obelisk her lines called from him honouring those killed fighting for Britain in both wars. Nobly you fought, your knightly virtue proved, your hallowed memory in the land you loved. It's a patriotic sentiment that mobilised loyalist paramilitaries during the troubles to commemorate their own fallen comrades at this hallowed location, while simultaneously serving as a remote spot to dump some of their Catholic victims. And so this severe sentinel, staring over the city of Belfast, enshrines an institutional unionist memory commemorating the link with Britain, a canonical line of memory underwriting the state itself. However, when I first visited Naka, I saw amidst the wreaths of poppies a wilted bunch of flowers that was mourning the loss of a victim of a loyalist violence, a victim of loyalist violence, Bernard Moon. And in one of those curious coincidences, he was taken from Hay Park. Avenue. I'm from the north of the city originally. I live in Hay Park Avenue. He was the one victim taken from that street, and his body was dumped there where he was killed. But you know that that memorial of the kind of the wilted flowers amidst the poppy wreaths is a poignant reminder of how such memorials can simultaneously act as sites of conflicting memories, where institutional, official, and public history can be haunted by individual memory, private grief, and unspeakable loss. Most memories, memorials operate on partisan, propagandistic and territorial, uh, 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 territorial levels. Indeed, as Jane Leonard's seminal 1997 study, Memorials to the Casualties of Conflict, which was commissioned by the Community Relations Council to survey the conflict or the landscape of conflict commemoration in contemporary Northern Ireland. This was a, a background document to investigate uh, options for a shared memorial in the north well, this study in 1997 revealed how a number of shared memorials is significantly outnumbered by paramilitary ones, which in valorising paramilitary struggles and sacrifices further reinforces the feelings that victims uh, have been strategically silent, silenced, sidelined and forgotten for the sake of political expediency. Such feelings were recognised in 1998 by the Northern Ireland Victims Commissioner, Sir Kenneth Bloomfield, and eponymously emphasised in his report, We Will Remember, him, remember Them. Leonard's survey published before the 1998 Good Friday Agreement, um, but this, uh, 
but this partisan and increasingly paramilitary commemoration of the past is all the more pronounced in the period since, and much to the distress of victims. A plight acknowledged recently by the President of Ireland, Michael D. Higgins, in 2012, he said that horrific memory is most vividly present in the lives of those whose loved ones uh, lost loved ones during the Troubles, who live with terrible injuries and a legacy of violence. More than any other group, they have been asked so much more than others and are asked daily to make the most difficult accommodation for peace. No group has done more to bring the benefits we have all gained from this peace process than they. Recent research, research suggests that although there are roughly 500 physical memorials to almost 4,000 victims of the Troubles, few commemorate the dead collectively. Indeed, the difficulties of collectively commemorating the dead were signalled from the very beginning, for example, in Bloomfield's report, which addressed the problem, how, the problem of how to create an imperishable memory, unquote, of those who were killed in the Troubles. But the document itself uh, and subsequent efforts conspicuously failed to reconcile literally how all the names of the dead could be accommodated in the shared space of a single physical memorial. Indeed, Bloomfield said, any attempt to incorporate a catalogue of the names of the victims in the central memorial would be certain to provide endless controversy and expose the subsequent memorial to a real danger of becoming a target for protest and demonstration. Bloomfield instead suggested that the construction of a shared war memorial, but that any physical memorial, would not feature the names of individuals or of specific tragic events. He proposed that any such necrology should be sublimated instead by some assuasive words from local artists. Quote, it would be best that the posts who have flourished amongst this most difficult of times should speak for all of us, the one of us who has any connection with, with the English department or indeed with canons. And kind of criticism really is that cannons and cannonballs can quickly uh, be forthcoming. This is one of the central political and ethical aporias in post conflict Northern Ireland, especially in a divided city like Belfast, where it appears impossible to commemorate the past or to honour the memory of the dead in a city without consensus, where even the Victims Commissioner from the very er- earliest outset enshrines a hierarchy of victims. For both the British and Irish states, as well as local political parties, a form of political or, 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 of amnesia appears politically expedient, if ethically egregious to victims. Indeed, just after the troubles erupted in the north, Belfast playwright Stuart Parker inveighed against amnesia of any kind as a solution uh, to the conflict racking the country. Nearly every day now in the north, the plague was out to forget the past. Such advice is both impracticable and pernicious. On the one hand, you can't forget a nightmare when you're dreaming it. On the other, it is survival through comprehension that is healthy, not survival through amnesia. Besides, the past is not a dead letter. Almost 50 years later, Parker's words stand in stark contradistinction to Jonathan Powell's rejoinder that we forget the past at a recent lecture in Derry. He said that we should forget and not allow ourselves to be drawn back into the past through any forms of truth and reconciliation processes. And blithely sidestepping the fact that we don't have any. The Irish President too has on several occasions in recent years repeated Parker's prescient warning, suggesting that, quote, to exclude, evade or affect an amnesia is to create an opportunity for a malignant future, unquote. Arguing against the moral and the political efficacy of amnesia, Higgins advocates that we instead engage with ideas of ethical memory. For the words, for the victims, the words of the philosopher Paul Ricoeur to be forgotten is to die twice has a particular meaning as it has for all of us. We have to construct an ethics of memory for our reconstructions of the past and the commemorations. Whatever mechanism are ultimately agreed upon for this task, the memory of victims must be appropriately re- reflected. Commemoration will always be complicated in the post-conflict context of a still divided society a setting that freights the already fraught dialectic of remembering and forgetting with yet further ethical and epistemological implications. In a city like Belfast, how can we conceive of, let alone construct, an ethics of memory as exhorted by Higgins? How can we honour the dead without being beholden to them? How can the memory of victims be reflected within wider society without wider society becoming a victim of memory? Perhaps, I would argue, performance itself offers one of the most effective mediums for creating ethical memory, providing an alternative mode of commemoration that can open up new ways of remembering and forgetting, whilst also eschewing amnesia as an approach 
and evading the problems posed by physical forms of memorialization. So I want to just briefly kind of offer a quick survey of this idea of performance uh, as remembrance. In contrast to the stolid economies of memorialization and history and memory that rely on the granite obduracy of stone and rock for the currency, are performative modes of commemoration, which deliberately draw upon performances effective and experiential registers, exploiting the ephemeral nature of its liveness with its attendant, imminent sense of loss that seems evocatively opposite when it comes to reflecting the loss of so many lives for so little. There are myriad examples of such performances and gestures and happening that resist being pressed into the service of partisan or political grand narratives. One single example is enacted every Easter in a Unitarian church in Dublin on Good Friday in its memorial service and ceremony when volunteers from the congregation take turns to read out the dead of all of those killed during the conflict, which happens on Good Friday, which is obviously all sorts of other connotations. In a similar such vein, and over the same symbolic dates in 1996, a happening artwork was mounted by Hilary Gilligan, uh, who transcribed in chalk onto the pavements of Belfast city centre the names at that stage of 3,300 victims who'd been killed at that per- by that period. Her actions were not subsidised or commissioned in any way by any funding body, but undertaken individually as a citizen appalled by the scale of suffering and the ongoing political stalemate. Her performance precipitated spontaneous reactions from spectators and shoppers and churchgoers, many of whom stopped to search for the names of their own loved ones, shared memories, offered refreshments, and even offered to help continue and finish the transcriptions. The fact that Gilligan undertook this work over Easter, commencing on Good Friday and finishing on Easter Monday, is all the more resonant, and not only in relation to Christian beliefs about the resurrected body, or in Republican ritualised commemorations of their own patriot ahead of Easter 1916, but as this foreshadowed the 1998 political settlement signed two years later on Good Friday. There are myriad other examples of such actions as responses to the Troubles and their aftermath, although troublingly many of these have, been, have not been recorded or documented. And yet in our light of her failure to deal with the burden of history, or as the Nigerian playwright Wally Suyenka suggests, the burden of memory, it seems somehow appropriate that these acts have disappeared, leaving with us memories of memories. The evanescence of such actions and the ephemeral presence of performance, given that it disappears at the moment of its iteration, is not the same as amnesia. For as Marvin Carson reminds us, theatre, if nothing else, is a memory machine, one through which official histories and institutional narratives can be performatively countered. There have been other fascinating efforts to record and remember the victims of the Troubles, such as uh, Elysia Truton's The Linen Memorial, This counter-monument, which itself is an extraordinary term, is a funerary record, a memento mori in the form of 400 linen handkerchiefs which were embroidered in chain stitch, which one has taken about four hours to do for each name, a process that took five years. Now, linen has long been used to shroud the dead, but its significance and signification here is all the more opposite and affecting in light of the shared memory of Belfast's industrial heritage as a global manufacturer of this most distinctive Irish commodity. Visual artists and photographers too have provided some of the most important responses to the aftermath of the Troubles and its legacy on post-conflict memory, such as David Farrell's Innocent Landscapes of 2001, a haunting collection of images exploring the recent excavations, indeed ongoing, for the missing bodies of the disappeared, which is remarkable for its recognition of the family's need for a closure and a wider struggle in both communities in the north to deal with the legacies of violence. Moreover, moreover, Innocent Landscape's exploration of the issues surrounding history, remembrance and forgiveness in a divided society are all the more extraordinary for their performative poetics of loss, longing and hope and for its transformation of spectators into civic witnesses. In fact, when you saw many of these images in the exhibition, which are under kind of house arrest, like all exhibitions are, it wasn't at all apparent that um, this was a landscape of the dead. They were very much draw upon the kind of the visual grammar of board fulture, bucolic images of Ireland as a kind of a rural idyll, uh, very much you know, deliberately drawn upon the valency of tourism and heritage and, and the history industries. And then you had that unsettling death charge when you realised latterly that these innocent landscapes had been named and mutilated to try and conduct, um, in, in, conduct in, 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 the, in the process of digging uh, for the bodies of the disappeared. 
Similarly, uh, Peter Richard's memorial in 2002 is remarkable for revealing how shrines and memorials encountered in a divided city like Belfast on a daily basis, whether they be improvised or institutional, monumental or momentary, serve to canonise and condemn and comfort communities, whilst helping collectively to define what will be remembered and what will be forgotten. Um, In the aftermath of conflict, memorial manifests how memory in cities as divided as Belfast it's impossible to reconcile uh, memories and suggesting that both closure and consensus will forever remain elusive. The artist Tom Malloy's uh, recent portraits as well, too, of RUC officers killed during the Troubles, exhibited in a series of paintings entitled Colleagues, also marks an effort to record the loss of so many lives, whilst Colin Davidson's ongoing project, Silent Testimony, which has toured uh, uh, um, internationally since it was first opened here in Belfast Adults Museum, was conducted in association with WAVE as the artist who was much more um, synonymous for his striking uh, headshots, which is again an uncomfortable valency, of famous poets, playwrights and musicians from the north compiled um, portraits of 18 civilians who became victims of the conflict through the loss of their loved ones. John Duncan's Boomtown of 2002 also captures how profound political progress locally combined with uh, international investment has transfigured Belfast with with rampant redevelopment. A transformational telos portrayed as the city's redemption in a glossy corporate rhetoric that scaffolds this process of change whilst it evacuates the recently traumatic history of the city. Its memory being inimical with the urban tale of regeneration stroke redemption. Duncan's images do more than simply document these changes. They subvert the salubrious subsurface of these glamorous hoardings, which are framed to expose how grotesquely decoupled they often are from their gritty locations in often socially deprived and dilapidated areas. Indeed, the loyalist flag that hangs limply from the lamppost in Tate's Avenue here, um, before the spectacle of trendy yuppie apartments, which have now sprung up, denotes working class loyalist alienation from the peace process and all its supposed peace dividends is an image which is eloquent, I think, of the entire body of Gary Mitchell's uh, drama, which helps deal with this dystopian uh, reality and this sense of disenfranchisement and dislocation. In post-apartheid South Africa, according to the theatre and performance scholar Catherine Cole, much of the most sophisticated work in dealing with the past is conducted by artists, because unlike social scientists and historians, they are not limited by wholly empiricist and positivist epistemologies. Given the execrable failure of politicians to deal with the past, it's all the more incumbent upon artists to conduct this work, and collectively, what they've produced makes it hard, actually, to agree with Cole's dismissal of positivist and empiricist approaches. Unlike South Africa, we've had no formal tribunal or a commission akin to the TRC to investigate the past. We have no recovery, empirical or otherwise, of what happened here. Moreover, positivist and empirical epistemologies are too often set in opposition to performance studies, which essentially privileges the evanescent and ineffable liveness of performance. A hermeneutic bias, I think, that occludes the possibility that positivist work can also possess its own performativity. And I'd like to give just, um, for the sake of brevity, one example of that. And that's taken from um, the recent AHRC-funded project, uh, uh, Visualising the Conflict. Um, uh, which was called uh, Remembering Victims, Survivors in Commemoration in Northern Ireland, uh, and a Visualising a Conflict follow-up project, which uh, took the form of a series of uh, maps that were produced, which are all available on the Cane Index uh, online. Maps have always been a subject of fascination for theatre scholars, given our disciplinary concerns with thresholds, space, place, borders and representation. A tendency that's particularly true for scholars of Irish theatre. After all, maps have never been two-dimensional topographical charts, but charged and contested post-colonial palimpsests. Indeed, you just have to look at the number of territorialising troops that have fundamentally shaped nationalist narratives of history, identity and ideology. The same troops have also played a crucial role in mapping the material and the metaphorical mise-en-scene of modern Irish drama, which itself has helped to create and latterly to contest the geographical imaginary of the nation. Now, the map that we're going to talk about here is supposed to be called a simple text map, comprising the names of all of those who were killed during the conflict. However, each name 
Each victim's name is plotted, again, a, a disturbing uh, verb in terms of its valency, in relation to where they were killed during, using GIS mapping um, uh, technology. The resulting data was distilled into a simple GIF animation that cumulatively marks all of the victims' names in the locations where they were killed to produce this final image. So when this map is clicked, the GIF causes this profane litany of names to be animated, again, another rather disturbing term, in a loop. Is it working? Uh, I actually tested it before and it didn't work. Oh, that's very frustrating. Sorry, it actually worked when it came in. Um, oh, I'll, I'll see if we can do it laterally at the end. But basically what happens is you have one or two names from the earliest days of you know, the 1966 kind of killings. They first kind of appear. The whole thing balloons. It's like a concertina. It just kind of balloons up with all of the names. And then it, it comes, it's kind of concertina again back into this kind of shape. Um, but it goes rather rapidly. But, uh, and, and it's only at the end that the, the contours and the shapes, which I'm going to talk about now, become uh, obvious. When this map is clicked, sorry, you're going to have to listen to my description, unfortunately. Um, when this gif is clicked, it causes this profane litany of names to be animated in a loop so that the vast hosts of the dead flicker before us and then fade, falling back. Ghostly shades whose forms swiftly blend and blur into shadows and shapes that slowly assume familiar form as eerily the distinctive borders of the Black North emerge, the darkly clotted centres denoting the urban crucibles of Derry and Belfast, as well as the rural killing fields of Mid-Ulster and South Armagh. This simple elegiac animation offers an impressionistic overview of the intensity of the conflict, but it's also suffused with an imminent sense of loss, an altogether haunting aura as all of those lost lives, those impalpable shade, shades are summoned so that this necrology acquires a ghostly geographical materiality as these spectral forms literally map a landscape of the dead. The palimpsestic inscription of names over place names also imposes a new valent in Shanahas textuality to the topography of the north. And strikingly, although the coordinates of the north's extensive coastline, nor those of its in the internal shores of Loch Ney or the ragged border with the Republic were ever entered, these physical borders and boundaries are easily discernible, as is the distinct shape of Northern Ireland, surrogated, it seems, through the actions of killing and dying, to provide a vivid commentary as to how a conflict involving the violent contestation of borders actually served to reinscribe them. So performing ethical memory. A final example of how performance can act literally and figuratively as an ethical mode of memory and as an effective way of remembering and representing history involves the Theatre of Witness, a project that was funded by the EU Structural Funds and based in Derry. This work was not testimony, uh, documentary theatre or verbatim theatre. Its material was derived not from reportage or from legal tribunals or documentary evidence, but from the lived experience of the participating individuals. Um, and there's two productions, uh, I Once Knew a Girl and We Carried Your Secrets, I'm going to briefly talk about. Both productions involve music, short films, song and some choreographed movement, but the entire cast were non-professional. The heart of each play lay in the testimonial monologues of each participant as they related traumatic stories of their own experiences, memories of events and actions that, in, and in some cases, had never been expressed before in public. Never, uh, um, never, some of them had never been expressed in private, let alone in public. Although the effect of this was evidently cathartic for some actors, and indeed, by extension, some audiences, the, the director of the separate re rejected re suggestions that this represented some form of publicly performed drama therapy, even though those involved often admitted that it was of immense individual therapeutic value. Now, the ethical aesthetics of the Theatre of Witness are complex, as regards both the process and the production. Its editorial ethics are especially problematic, not only in terms of how those... Uh, selected to be involved is decided, but how each script for each show is devised. Although all of the words are performed by each actor are their own, the overall text was generated through an extensive collaborative process in the course of which scripts were structured and edited by Sepignuk, from interviews and workshops and conversations to, with the individuals who eventually signed off on their own roles, so to speak, which they went on to perform. In many ways, the problems with this praxis are not new. They merely mobilise the age-old platonic aporia haunting theatre, namely its vexed relationship between performance and truth, 
As throughout history, theatre has been both lauded for its truthful rendering of the complexities of the human condition and condemned for, at the core, being a lie, a fabrication. In both productions, the, the actors were unmoored from the role of impersonation. They played themselves. An immensely seductive aesthetic um, which heightened the reality effect of the play. Thus, for many audience members, um, these stories were not mendaciously mediated through actors or authors, but delivered authentically, without impersonation, falsification or mediation, with complete fidelity to the truth. Now, such a simplistic, if seductive, um, assumption is obviously problematic. For although the actors are not performing fiction per se, they are performing. This is a performance. Nevertheless, the protein borders between the two are quite obviously porous and provisional, especially when individuals on stage were quite often brimful with emotion and appeared on the cusp of breaking down and were subsequently supported by other members of the cast in unprompted, unscripted, more real uh, uh, kind of gestures. To give one example, a young man, Finbar O'Hagan, whose Sinn Féin father, councillor, had been assassinated by loyalist paramilitaries with the collusion of the RUC, was physically and psychologically incapable of delivering his own monologue in situ each night. So it was recorded in a short film, and each night this played onto a large screen behind Finbar, who was centre stage, s- sitting silently sobbing at a drum set before him, the drum set being, quote, the only thing I can hit and get away with it. Quietly sobbing as his story plays as he relates the, the, the traumatic impact that the murder of his father had on the rest of his life, and overwhelmed with emotion, as soon as this unbearably moving testimony finished in the video, Finbar lashed into drums, into the drum set in this um, frenzied, percussive expiation of grief and rage, leaving him a complete emotional wreck for the rest of the performance, though the rest of his cast members supported him throughout, including James, a volunteer in the UVF, the same organisation that killed Finbar's father. Finbar's story of the devastation that followed this killing and his violent feelings of anger, grief and loss, compounded by the police's failure to investigate the cases and any lack of, uh, of justice, was confessional and cathartic. His monologue movingly recorded his struggle to make sense of his experience in what was a faltering and a rather fragmented story, an impressionistic account of the shattering impact of trauma. There is no beginning, middle or end. It's never had an end, he says. His monologue also exemplifies the hazy lines between history and memory, becomes, which become harder to differentiate after the experience of trauma. I remember things happening, but I don't remember what happened when, admits Finbar in his opening line, though the rest of his speech strives to recall small details of the day his father was killed and its immediate impact. I remember this. I remember this. It kind of marbles his monologue throughout. However, his struggle to remember... To record and to relay what happened is hauntingly undermined towards the end of the story with his voice cracking out with emotion. He says, I wish I could tell the difference between a story and a memory. Similarly, the monologue of Robin Young, who was an RUC officer who is now in the PSNI, records his traumatic experiences of the Oma and the Koshkwin bombings where he was leading in the clear-up and the clean-up of body parts. Um, which led this trauma uh, led to the disintegration of his marriage and his mental health, so that in his monologue, uh, history and autobiography merge. Um, he talks about the Koshkwin bombing, um, which is uh, the, the first event that he had to kind of uh, uh, attend to work on and, and clearing up the body parts. This was when Patsy Gillespie had been handcuffed to a huge van bomb and forced to drive it as the first of a series of proxy bombs launched by the IRA against military checkpoints. They detonated by remote control and Patsy Gillespie was vaporised along with five British soldiers. Uh, Assigned to clean up body parts in the aftermath of this, Robin's memories of these events, as well as his own psychological breakdown, is fragmentary and incomplete and partial in both senses of the word. His narrative is far from forensic. Indeed, it's factually incorrect in places. Robin states several times that there were seven soldiers in the van when actually there were five. Although his account may be inadequate as factual a documentary record of these events, it does provide us with an invaluable insight into the experiences and the subjectivity of the testimonial subject. Indeed, the authenticity of these stories stems not from their factual veracity, but flows from the power of personal testimony of these witnesses before live audiences, who are transformed from passive spectators into active witnesses. Both Robin and Finbar's stories provide a powerful corrective to official, institutional and mediatised versions of actual events, as personal memory complements and sometimes contests political history. 
As such, theatre of witness presents a new mode of history play, a history as memory play. It is a form that cannot easily be pressed into the service of official or ideological narratives as it slips the positivist and empirical bonds of representation to present history as memory and counter-memory. To borrow from Friel, whose work often explores the vagaries between memory and history and identity, the theatre of witness is not concerned with staging the literal past, the facts of history that shape us, but images of the past embodied in language. Their cast, however, is entirely non-professional. And uh, uh, um, actually, I'm just going to cut on uh, uh, just a little bit, a little bit on for the sake of uh, time. In her study of the South Africa uh, Truth and Reconciliation Commission, Catherine Cole explicitly draws attention to the fact that the efficacy of the TRC in South Africa stemmed not just from its recovery of truth and its release of hidden history, but from its performance, its, quote, public enactment that was about people speaking and being heard. Okay. Um, this, the epic scale of the TRC enveloped a whole country, capturing its imagination by collating and commingling the stories of individuals so that collectively they came to stand in for the larger national narrative of reconciliation. Accordingly, comparisons with the TRC were something as modest as a a theatre of witness seems risible and hubristic. But as a much smaller micro-narrative, the theatre of witness's pursuit of truth and testimony, its extensive and intensive tours throughout the North as part of a pronounced civic effort to engage with the public in acts of remembrance and reconciliation, as well as its use of performance as a means of encountering the other and to register and record the marginalised voices of those who learned to be silent, was remarkable. Its work reverses Hamlet's claim that the play is a thing, as the show very much took a secondary, I would argue, and subordinate role to the post-show discussions between actors and audiences that, facilita- that followed each performance. Um, in many ways, these were ideal opportunities to hear the stories uh, of, of the other and were crucial to the event as an exemplary effort to create a civic forum to engage with issues raised by the show, with different audiences in different cities and towns, all encouraged to share their own stories and memories. Storytelling as acknowledged by healing through remembering plays a crucial role in conflict transformation because it facilitates, quote, the negotiation of memory and counter-memory with an audience, which in turn allows, quote, the creation of shared memories. Thus, the embodied memories witnessed live by different audiences in vastly different constituencies was often transformational. I went to uh, at least 12 of these in different uh, towns and uh, 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 cities. This was pointedly manifest in the case of Catherine Gillespie, the widow of Patsy, who had been killed in a cash crime bomb. Kathleen attended We Once Carried Your Secrets, or shall we carried your secrets, and she subsequently asked to be involved in the next production, um, I Once Knew a Girl, so that she could tell her story. It's one of the most powerful examples I've ever encountered of political theatre literally turning its audiences into actors, and of theatre's ethical capacity to complicate collective memory. Okay. Um, Finally, um, in relation to that, on stage, individuals whose politics, memories and identities were often in violent opposition to one another shared the stage together, not merely tolerating one another but as firm friends, even though they still cleaved to very different political convictions. This is clearly manifest in the warm relationship shared by Finbar, whose history left him profoundly hostile towards the police, with both Robin and James, the UVF and the RUC man, who would always have been erstwhile anyways. It was even more powerfully embodied in I Once Knew a Girl, in which Kathleen Gillespie, who's the figure, the second last figure on the, on the right, shared space uh, with, with, um, with Anne Walker, who's a woman on the far, on the far, I was going to say she was on the far left, but that's, she wasn't in the official IRA, um, but she was in a provisional IRA, and she was an IRA quartermaster in Derry. Um, and both women, who were anxious about meeting one another in the course of the production and the process for this production and um, became firm friends. Um, the politics of these relations on stage were visually potent symbols to audiences of the possibilities of reconciliation and a reminder that meaningful reconciliation means much more than simply telling our stories. It's about listening to others, uh, an exchange and an experience that theatre transacts all the time as a uniquely public and participatory forum. However, given that our peace process is predicated on a disavowal of history as demonstrated by the continuing failure to deal with the past, the theatre of witness, along with some of these other performative practices, provide an ethical form of redress and remembrance. 
They all draw upon the effective and the experiential power of performance to transform passive spectators often into eponymous witnesses and actors. Their ethics and effect flow from its affect, that in seeking to challenge and change its audience, they also seek to unspool their memories, stories and experiences. Although diffuse, dispersed and disconnected from one another, many of these performative practices collectively draw on memory and counter-memory to embody what was invisible, to make manifest what was unseen, and to speak about that which is silent. And just finally, the expansion of commemorative culture in post-conflict Belfast, dubbed the Memory Boom by Elisabetta Vigiani, dovetails with John Duncan's Boomtown, as both signal the vertiginous speed of change in Belfast's cityscape and collective memory. In the regeneration of this ghost town, as Parker calls it, architecture and urban planning have become instrumentalised as they seek to erase the memory of conflict with an ersatz cosmopolitanism, a shiny patina, patina sealing away an ugly past as this filthy modern tide sluices away the blood from the curbs. Whilst this late capitalist evacuation of history is nothing new in a postmodern age, in post-conflict cities it becomes especially problematic when it's ideologically allied with the politically expedient uh, amnesia of the state and those in power. However, theatres, both old and new, as memory machines, can contest this process, for performance not only offers a way to remember the past or to quote Higgins to make new and benign memories in the future, but to stage memories in the present that release those of the other. <laughs>